Welcome. Again, I apologize for starting a little bit late today. I am Deanna Dugas. I am the Director of Instruction and Research Support here at New Mexico State University. Um, with me is Lauren Ferguson. She is one of the graduate students who's working with me on the Sweeter Grant. And today's panel is going to talk about HPC or supercomputing inside of the classroom. Usually we have conversations about how to use an HPC, right, when it comes to like the command line and the nitty gritty details. One thing that we keep realizing is that the ability to use a supercomputer, use an HPC inside the classroom gives the students and the researchers skills that will take them far, far beyond the classroom environment. So the panel today is put together by several individuals that are going to talk about how they've used a supercomputer inside of the classroom, not the nitty gritty details, but why they did it, how they sort of integrated it into it, and what kinds of students they were teaching when they did this. Um, Everybody is going to present, well, the panelists are going to present for about five minutes. Then we have a couple of questions for the panel discussion, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A from the audience. So please go ahead. If you think of questions while people are speaking, put them into the chat. Otherwise, when the panelists are done, we'll open it up for Q&A and you can simply speak with them. We do have several Lauren Ferguson's that are still on the participants list. If you don't mind, Go ahead and hover over your name and you'll be able to see a little more button. Click on that and you can correct the name so that you are actually who you are and not my delightful graduate student. All right, with that, I'm going to allow Lauren to start the presentations. Hi everyone, I'm the actual Lauren Ferguson, like Dr. Dugas said. Um, so first up, we're going to be listening to a presentation from Christina Cox. She's from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. All right, thanks Lauren. Um, okay, I had my slides up. Of course they've disappeared. One second. <laughs> oh, here we go, okay. All right, back to the beginning. So hi everyone, my name is Christina Cook. Um, I am not an instructor, actually. I'm a research computing facilitator at the Center for High Throughput Computing um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, but I'm gonna be talking about a partnership um, we've had for quite a while now with a course in the statistics department, STAT 605, um, kind of, yeah, how that came about and, what's what's involved. So introducing uh, the collaborators. Um, so I'm a member of the Center for High Throughput Computing on campus. Um, just a little bit of context for what we do. Like most computing centers, we have two large scale computing systems um, kind of detailed here. Most of our resources are public use fair share priority, um, including for use by not just research, but um, instructors who want to collaborate with us. Um, our accounts, this will be relevant later, are based on the common campus login identity provider. Um, and we have um, myself and a team of dedicated research computing facilitators. So we have people at the center who can help um, liaise with um, instructors um, about potentially using our resources in their courses. Um, the other uh, player in this collaboration is um, statistics instructor John Dillette at our university. Um, so he kind of developed and pioneered this graduate level statistics course um, that was originally kind of a special topics course and is now kind of part of, it has its, its own course number. Um, and it was originally aimed at accelerated master's students who would be going into data science careers. So these were um, people basically doing a fifth year master's um, going to, you know, after they graduate are going to go work at different companies doing data science work. And it's focused on the course itself is focused on data science tools. So really programming, um, but with a 
the focus being on data science applications. So um, in the course, he covers using the shell, using a command line text editor, um, using R, and some basic C and C++ programming. So that's the course he was developing. We're a resource center on campus. And so he came to us with this original question or proposition, can you help me do something with cloud computing for this course? Just thinking ahead for preparing these students for, you know, as they go and work in industry, they may have, um, they may be working at companies where they need to do the cloud. So we couldn't do that because that's not, you know, the service we offer. So I said, we can't do that, but we could do this. Would you be interested? And if he was really committed to doing cloud computing, I think our conversation would have ended there. And he would have had to go find some other, you know, entity on campus to partner with. Um, but he was open to kind of changing course slightly, um, doing something on our high throughput system so that the goal of, for the course became not so much like, here's how you use AWS or, or Google Cloud, but just here's what it can be like to use a big parallel system and how it can help you do more work in less time. And he had a real science example that he was already using for the course that was gonna adapt really nicely as a high throughput workload. So that was kind of the final decision we came to. Earlier in the course, the students would write some R code to analyze these like galaxy spectra. And then as a later assignment in the course, they would run it on, I think it was like thousands of, of input spectra files on our high throughput system. Um, so this is kind of the process we went through. <laughs> um, there may be more details than are needed, but we consulted. Then there was some prep. We made it, we did a presentation for the class, um, as well as a little bit of a demo hands-on thing. So that we prepared. The instructor, um, John, prepared the kind of homework assignments he wanted to do, any tools they needed in advance. Um, and he, so that was how we divvied up the preparation and then the execution of tasks. Um, and then it has ended up that people can use our resources for the end of course project if they, if they need it. Um, and so this was maybe not asked for, but I think um, keys for success was communication about goals and who's responsible for what. And then related to that, making sure that students had the skills they needed to use our resources and that the instructor was gonna provide adequate support on their side. And we were gonna provide adequate support on ours. Um, at the beginning, I mentioned accounts being, you know, standard university accounts that made it a little bit easier for us to automate generation of all these accounts that we needed for this course so people could use their real net id login um, to access resources so i'll share these slides i'll drop them in the chat in a minute um, and uh, so we wrote a little story about this for our website and i will update these slides once i get a copy of the course page from john if he's able to share it um, so people can just look at the syllabus and um, i've included a link to the slides that i gave in the course presentation. Hopefully that was no more than five minutes. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Christina. Um, next we have Christopher Coley from the US Air Force Academy. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, let's see, hopefully I'm sharing correctly. Uh, do you see my slides and not something else? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so um, I'm here to share my perspective here at the Air Force Academy. Um, I'm an assistant professor of aeronautics. Um, and so I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, use of HPC in our aeronautical engineering curriculum here at the Academy. Um, just a general overview, uh, we have three classes where our cadets um, really are, are expected to use uh, CFD. Um, and so you see those listed here. Uh, so, you know, one thing about the Air Force Academy, we're, we're an all undergraduate institution. So I just want to make sure that you keep that in mind throughout my discussion. You know, we don't have any graduate students here. Um, they're, all, they're all learning this at the undergraduate level. 
Um, Aero 342, Computational Aerodynamics, that is the introduction uh, for our cadets. It's basically their junior level class uh, where we teach them how to use um, CFD software and how to run that on high performance computing resources. Um, Aero 472, the Advanced Computational Aerodynamics, is a, uh, oh, I guess before I move on, Aero 342, um, that's, a, that's a required course for all of our aeronautical engineering uh, majors. Um, Aero 472, that's a, a follow-on class that's an elective. Um, that's a research-based class that uh, several of our cadets choose to take. Um, and then Aero 499 is an opportunity to do independent study or independent research where, you know, if they choose to do CFD-related research, um, they also continue to use the HPC systems. So, you know, our, our uh, intention through this course sequence is really to educate our cadets through HPC-enabled research, right? And um, in order to do that, they need to know how to be able to run CFD. They need to be able to know how to access the, you know, the HPC systems and set up their jobs. Um, and so that's where 342 comes into play to give them that baseline knowledge. And then the other classes are an opportunity for them to expand their knowledge, to continue their education through research activities. Um, one thing I'll, I'll mention, we have the High Performance Computing Research Center here at the Air Force Academy. Um, that center does live in the aeronautics department, um, uh, but they do support all of the HPC needs for all the departments throughout the Air Force Academy. Um, so if I go to my next slide here, you kind of see how those classes uh, fit in relative to each other in our curriculum. Um, so your know, core arrow is a requirement for everyone here at the Academy. That's just where they learn some of the basics of of aerodynamics. Uh, and then we build on that though, like I said, Aero 342's introduction to learning how to do CFD itself. Uh, and then at the tip of the pyramid there, you see uh, the um, 472, 499 that I mentioned before. Uh, but we've also listed a couple other classes there. For example, the aircraft design, Aero 482. Uh, what we found is a lot of these cadets, since they have the ability and, and the skills to do CFD, they will choose to leverage that in their other classes, even though it might not be required. Um, they recognize the value there. And, um, and they will leverage it in those other classes as well. So uh, we've got a little bit more just fine detail about what these classes actually look like. Aero 342, um, I think that the unique things about this class is that um, all of our Aero majors, um, and I, again, just to emphasize that they're juniors in their undergraduate education at this point, they all learn how to do CFD. They all learn how to uh, set up their jobs, submit them on uh, the HPC systems, and, and we use the Department of Defense HPC systems. Um, we do have a small cluster here at, our, at the Academy. Um, we've built that system so it mimics what they see in the DOD systems. But specifically, what we wanted them to do is learn how to actually do HPC the way that they will do it when they commission um, and when they're in the Air Force, right? If they were to actually do this as a, as a practicing engineer. So that was really the... the but the thought and the motivation behind the course design is to introduce them to all the tools that they would use if they were doing this for real. So this is not just about, hey, here's, a, here's an idea, here's the concept, and now you understand what CFD is, but it, it really is about making them um, competent practitioners using the exact tools and systems that they would use um, outside of the Air Force Academy. Uh, and then, like I said, 472, as a follow-on course. And what we found is a lot of cadets um, find that they have a really great experience in Aero 342. They really enjoy doing CFD. And so what they follow on with 472. Um, and 472 is a research-based elective, as I mentioned before. Um, all the projects in that class are, are sponsored by you know, government or industry partners. And uh, they work with a research mentor. And uh, we just, we keep their accounts active. Um, you know, we pair them up with a research mentor and uh, they leverage the skills that they learned in the previous class to, uh, to investigate a lot of really interesting research questions that we have. So um, that's just a brief overview of what we're doing here at the Air Force Academy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think as, as we continue through the, the panel discussion, I'll, I'll be happy to elaborate more or answer any questions that anyone has. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Next, we're going to have um, Lisa Perez from Texas A&M. Um, oh, 
almost there, sorry. I had to steal the screen. Uh, I can just move this. Um, there we go. So I'm very happy to be here and I want to thank you for the invite. I, my presentation will be a little bit of a higher umbrella. Uh, we support a lot of courses through HPRC. I guess I should start with introducing myself. My name is Lisa Perez. I'm the director for uh, the Advanced Computing Enablement Group uh, at High Performance Research Computing at Texas A&M University. Um, so we support a lot of courses uh, on our system by providing the resources that they need to use our system. Um, but I also teach my own courses and have been closely involved in developing material in other courses on campus. So our major workhorse for providing these resources to incorporate in the class is using the Open On Demand portal. Um, so we've deployed that on our HPC systems and it greatly expands the usability to incorporate into courses for faculty. Um, so the portal is very graphical in nature. It means that the students don't have to install anything. All they have to do is open up their browser and have an account and they can log in and go. It also allows them to fire up graphical programs, get a terminal without having to do anything on their computer. Um, so for me, this has been one of the most important advances in HPC for faculty incorporate in their courses, especially at the undergraduate level. YouTube training videos. Um, while they can be time consuming to create, uh, you can get started with them pretty easy when you have it tailored for your course. Uh, we have a lot of training videos that are available um, and we try to put them into playlists so that the students don't get overwhelmed when they come in. So we have these little five minute videos, which are quite critical for people when they first get started. Jupyter Lab is heavily used in courses. Um, it was a huge uptick in uh, use in courses for Python and other uh, languages. Um, so providing the support for Jupyter Lab through the portal has also been very important for uh, uh, the faculty um, to incorporate HPC in their courses. Uh, now with this, sometimes the students don't don't realize that they're using HPC. And in a way that's good, and in a way that's bad. The good part is most people hear high performance computing, HPC system, and they immediately freeze and feel that they don't know how to do anything and they're afraid to do anything. Uh, so to provide an interface that is intuitive and easy for them to use to begin with, uh, and then introducing the fact that you are using an HPC system, uh, has I've found to be helpful uh, when introducing especially some of the you know, undergraduate courses um, into the coursework. And then introducing the fact that what you're actually using after the fact uh, can be helpful. Uh, we've also developed uh, something called the toolbox in the OOD. Um, and this gives a, a snapshot of the statistics on the system and you know about accounts and disk quotas and jobs, the jobs that you have running. Uh, so for those that are doing more advanced work, it makes it easier for the student to understand what's happening on the system. Okay, so I didn't want to start with this slide because I felt that everyone would just shut off if I had a giant slide full of classes. Um, but this list is not really even complete. This is the list of courses that we know have used our resources, um, but I know there are some other ones out there. And this is not for every semester. This is from 2019 on from what we've collected. Um, so you can see, you know, we have the aerospace, we have the uh, life sciences, we have computer science, 
chemical engineering, um, the genomics, uh, so a long list of different departments and courses. But what you will see is that we have 14 undergraduate courses and 24 graduate courses. So now I'm very proud of the 14 undergraduate courses. Oops, sorry, my, my timer. I didn't know it was gonna make noise. Okay, um, so we have 14 undergraduate courses and 24 graduate courses. Okay, um, so I'm proud of the 14, uh, but I would like to increase that number um, because I think that's, you know, we've done a good job of providing the resources for the graduate courses to incorporate, um, but I want to reach out more for the undergraduate because the earlier they get involved, the, the higher the probability they would be able to use it in their future work. Okay, so I just have a couple more small things that I want to mention. Um, so for the undergraduate courses, what I normally do is have tailored documentation and tutorials. And that's where I find you really need that for success in the undergraduate courses. The graduate courses a little bit less, but you still need something um, in that fashion. So the, the ease of access, um, with the graphical interface, not having to install anything on the local computer um, to get started with, and then moving into maybe something more detailed command line um, as where we've really been able to expand the use in the classes. Now, most of my uh, work has been in, um, I'm computational chemist by trade. I teach a graduate course in uh, quantum chemistry, uh, molecular reactions and so forth. Uh, so. I have many, many assignments in my class. So they get to learn from all levels. A lot of the undergraduate courses may only have one assignment or they may have a couple of assignments and that's pretty typical. Um, but we run, we run the, whole, the whole gambit from they use it for everything to it's just one. Um, the last thing that I wanna mention here is easy file editing and file transfer. So the, the graphical on-demand portal where the students don't have to install anything they can edit their files from the files menu, okay? And they can drag and drop their files back and forth. And that's also very crucial on cutting down on the number of tickets and the stress on the faculty side. So I will stop there. I could talk forever. <laughs> I've done so many classes I could talk forever, but I will stop there. Um, I did see that there was a question in the chat. Do you want me to answer that now or wait? Why don't you wait? Because we've got a couple of different examples of resources. So we'll answer that question broadly. And then I will attempt to stop sharing. Otherwise, the next person can steal it. So the next person is Tim Kaiser from the National Renewable Energy Lab, also known as NREL. OK, hopefully I'm Continue. All right. Oh, good, 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 good. Let me start this. So, uh, yeah, I've, this I, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart: uh, high performance computing and high performance computing in education. Uh, I've been in this business for a long time. Um, at a number of different universities and now at a national lab. Um, so this is, again, it's kind of a little different perspective, but uh, still tried to answer the question. So you know, I've worked in uh, teaching several different types of classes from high school uh, graduate classes. Uh, all of my materials that we teach at the graduate level, I think are understandable at the undergrad level also. Um, currently doing a lot more work with uh, researchers and professionals as opposed to uh, regular students. Although I think one of the more interesting presentations I did uh, recently was actually to a group of faculty, and I'll meet, mention that briefly in a few seconds. Um, so I'll just go through the various disciplines of uh, starting in high school. Uh, most recently, I uh, was working with a MINDS faculty who had a grant to work with uh, students, uh, trying to get them interested in STEM. These are mostly from underrepresented populations. We also are primarily he, well, I guess I actually help with this. I actually, we actually got them up and running 
on a home computer. And along with this, did an introduction to high performance computing. Again, this I think was completely understandable even at the high school level. Uh, so, in terms of grads and professionals, uh, you know, it's just about every area of STEM that you can think of um, you know, medical, uh, CS, geology, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all the way down to hydrodynamics. Um, CFD was mentioned already earlier, uh, done some of that also. Um, so disciplines, uh, again, uh, covering just about every topic that you can think of. Uh, the, uh, you know, as mentioned earlier about uh, running via portal, which I think is a really good idea. However, uh, a lot of the machines out there, your only option is command line. So, you know, I do an extensive work in, in teaching command line, in addition to the standard uh, HPC topics. Um, let's see, Jupiter was mentioned. Uh, again, that's one of the things where uh, we've actually at NREL talked about you know, how can you launch uh, parallel applications from inside of a Jupyter, Jupyter uh, lab or Jupyter notebook. Uh, talking about libraries, I think is important. You know, again, CFD programming is, is up and coming or has been around, but it's actually becoming more, much more important uh, even at NREL. Um, you can see the list there. I don't need to go over all of this. Uh, one of the more interesting talks that I did last year was at the 2021 Tapia Conference and did this with, uh, in collaboration with Tom McKell from LANL. And it was actually talking about how you can uh, put together a Raspberry Pi cluster and use this for uh, HPC and in education. And I should have put in a picture of my cluster. I, uh, I'll add it in, in the slides that uh, I, uh, share, I'll, I'll, you'll see a picture of my cluster. But yeah, this was a lot of fun. It uh, generated a lot of interest in um, actually, you know, people being able to put together uh, small clusters and, you know, even if they, if they don't have access to the standard resources, I mean, it just works. It's amazing how, what you can do on a very small cluster like that. Uh, another interesting talk that I did earlier this year was on teaching HPC concepts uh, using a debugger. And this was actually presented to a group of CS professors and uh, they just absolutely loved it. And I'll just leave it at that. Won't say anything more about that whole interaction, but I think you can probably read between the lines. Uh, anyway, so uh, you know, why do I do this? Basically, this is my job. Now, my job is to help scientists do their science, and especially with respect to uh, high performance computing. And like I said, I've been at this a long time and I, I really enjoy working with other people. Um, so how is it presented? Again, that's going to be dependent on the audience, but you know, I've done semester classes and you know, basically that's a st pretty standard class, lots of discussions, uh, demos, uh, you know, we have programming assignments, I mentioned this with respect to the, the uh, Mines professor, uh, worked with him uh, presenting uh, HPC concepts, and that was pretty much hands-on. Um, and again, I mentioned that we helped them get their own machine running at home. I am a very example-oriented person. I have tons and tons of examples on my Git repository. Uh, vast majority of those are related to high-performance computing. So feel free to grab anything you want from that web page. And I think that might be it. That's it. Okay. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And then um, the last panelist is Brooke Milligan from New Mexico State University, who is graciously joining us despite technical issues that resulted from me. Sorry, Brooke. Um, so I will be presenting the slides and he will be speaking. So give me one moment to get those slides up. Okay, while Deanna's doing that, let me just make sure that you can hear me. We can hear you, Brooke, and the slides are up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let me introduce myself. I'm Brooke Milligan. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Biology. 
um, here at NMSU. Um, and I've worked with Diana over the years and in, in various uh, capacities. And so it's a great pleasure to participate in this in this panel. Uh, I assume you're showing the first slide. I'm on the phone, so I can't see anything, um, but we'll do the best here. Um, my uh, own personal background includes a lot of uh, quantitative analysis and, and computing. And so that's something I try to introduce my students to in the classroom. So over the years, I've taught a lot of classes, all of which are, are you know, subject matter biology classes, none of which, well, one potentially is a, contains, it's a quantitative modeling class. So that's a little bit more um, aligned with, with direct use of HPC. But most of the time, there's not, um, the, the components of computing are sort of very secondary to the, to the scope of the course. And in fact, among biology students, this is often their first experience ever with any kind of coding or use of computers beyond you know, word processing or whatever. Um, generally speaking, I've always in the past relied on you know, students installing software on their own laptops and, and whatever. And um, that has led to, of course, a number of challenges, which I'm sure you can all imagine. This fall, I started with this course, which I'll describe for you in a second. Um, conservation biology was the, really the first time I've tried to actually make use directly at a, in a fairly uh, major way the HPC resources as a way to overcome some of the issues that I've encountered in the past. So let me tell you a little bit about this particular course and you know what we're what I'm trying to do with it and how to how I'm trying to integrate some HPC resources into the class. So Diana, if you could switch to the second slide. Um, this is a broad overview. Um, this is, of course, an undergraduate course, although it's a um, junior or senior level course. Um, there's often, you know, a couple of graduate students in it, um, but mostly they're seniors. Um, so they're fairly experienced with biology, but as I said, mostly unexperienced with computing of any sort. So I have these three goals in this class. Um, of course, the main goal is that the students understand the, the biological principles that we're trying to cover, but I feel that it's really important that they also improve their communication and, and their ability to think quantitatively and incorporate, you know, quantitative analysis into their, you know, writing and thinking about conservation biology, you know, they get the better practice using data understanding what data means and so forth. Um, so it's in sort of accomplishing this, this goal of integrating the communication and, and quantitative thinking and analysis that I've been trying to use the HPC resources in this course. So as I said in the past, there are many challenges. Um, you know, students often have difficulty installing the software, you know, R and various things onto their uh, computers. And everybody seems to end up with a slightly different uh, software platform. And they are, you know, incredibly adept at finding things that I have never even heard of or encountered despite years and years of working with this kind of software. But they seem to come up with the problems immediately with no, no effort. Um, and so it, it creates a lot of difficulty uh, in classes like this with inexperienced um, uh, students, at least from the computing side. Um, they often also get caught up in the, in the technical aspects of coding, and it leads to a sort of loss of focus, I think, from the learning objectives of, you know, how do you think about quantitative data and uh, incorporate that into um, an analysis and a, and a paper or whatever. So what I've done this this fall for this course, where this is, as I said, the first time through, and we're you know only halfway through the semester, 
but I've been making use of the on-demand interactive uh, uh, interface to to our studio, and that was in order to provide, of course, a common uh, software environment to avoid the difficulty of installations and hopefully avoid the problems of everyone having slightly different versions and, and software environments. I've also been providing them with, um, so we've been developing, you know, our markdown documents that include, you know, some data analysis and as well as all the text and, and so forth. I've been trying to give them templates to start with that have some of the code that's needed to like generate graphs and, and figures of various sorts so that they can concentrate more on the document per se and what it says and how they can integrate you know, figures and data analysis into it without getting buried in deeply into the coding process itself. Um, I would much prefer that our students learn that but it's just really not feasible for me as a single faculty to bring the, the, uh, all the students up to, to full speed. So this has been a, a, an experiment with that intermediate zone of trying to get them access to the um, analysis and a framework for them to write about it and think about it, but without having them learn all the intricacies of, of coding from the very beginning. Um, so why don't you switch to the next slide, which is just showing you know, a few examples. Of course, you've probably all seen the R Studio interface. If not the uh, on demand, then you may be familiar with it elsewhere. But it's a, you know, for the students, it, it turns out to be a fairly convenient graphical interface that again, they only have to use their browser to uh, interact with. And so it simplifies a lot of things. And they're able to create documents that, you know, the one on the right is just an example of a portion of a document that a student created um, that's describing an analysis. And, and then these are some of the, just a couple of quotes that I got from the students in, in by, you know, in asking them how they felt about this. So they're generally positive. Um, you know, about the ability to manipulate some of these models, some of the assignments, I guess I didn't say, but this is, this is a whole sequence of assignments covering a variety of different topics. And some of them, I've allowed them, you know, we've set up various models or analyses that depend on certain parameters that they can play around with and see how that affects the, the results that they get. So that it's, um, my hope is that it gives them much more intuition about the, quanti the quantities that they're involved, are interacting with and how they, uh, how they change in response to some of the various parameters. So I think they're basically positive. Why don't you go to the next slide, which just summarizes a few things. Um, so I'm seeing that there are a few difficulties wrestling with the software environment, both for them and for me, for the most part. The having a common file system um, on the you know, HPC cluster, which is all being used here at the uh, system at NMSU, um, allows me to provide them with the data sets and so forth that they can then copy over easily and start making use of. So that distribution of files and so on is, is good. Um, so this, this a couple of drawbacks I'll point out is for this particular purpose of using you know, the on-demand RStudio, the students really are not interacting with the command line at all. They, but in order to get access to the system, they need to go through the training and learn all of that. That isn't really a big um, problem. And I, broadly, I totally encourage them to do that. But it does end up being some extra hurdles that the students need to go through in order to get access to this environment. Um, there are also, it turns out, students who have used R and RStudio 
on their own and have it installed and would prefer to use it in the environment that they are familiar with rather than a new one. And so they feel that it's actually increasing the difficulty because they have to, you know, download things themselves separately, you know, the data sets and so on separately. On the other hand, they are also the most uh, adept students in this realm. And so it's not really, I don't think that's really turning into a big difficulty and I'd weigh the broader benefit to the less experienced people uh, more strongly. Overall though, I think, so this adds a, a you know, it greatly improves the ability to bring computing into a classroom in a, a relatively simple environment. On the other hand, there's still these perennial challenges, which are which are huge for biology students, um, which is getting lost in the code, you know, even if it's you know minimal. Um, and so they're losing the the focus on sort of the science and communication aspect because sometimes they get you know concerned or or um, you know caught up in the coding part, and so. What I think this is showing is that that creating uh, there are ways to to make it easy to do the analyses and so on, but it's really still hard to get the students to think about what they mean and incorporate that into their understanding of the biology. And so that remains a, a ongoing challenge that that uh, I think will be there regardless of whether or not the computing side of this becomes easier and easier. So with that, I think I'll um, you know, stop and uh, uh, be happy to answer questions as we come into that part of the session. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we have one question already in the chat, which sort of ties into a question that I had. Um, can everybody please explain sort of whether or not you used the HPC system that your campus has, um, if you chose to use a different one, and how you chose which one to use if you had multiple options? The question from the chat is specifically, do I need to have the resource allocation for me to access and utilize an HPC? And how much will the startup be? I feel like Lisa should go first. <laughs> All right, well, so I can for the, um, oh. All right, say, so Lisa, oh. then Brooke. <laughs> uh, so for, for our courses, I. Um, we have it. It's structured that the students get a basic account, which gives them 5,000 of these things called SU service units, which is normally sufficient for the work that they do um, for the vast majority of the courses. And then the, the faculty gets a, a, also an account. Um, and that account is I, our accounts are good for a year. Um, we don't cut them off. I, at the, the end of the semester at this point in time. Uh, so our courses all utilize our systems at a and for the, from what I know. a and is pretty big. <laughs> so I'm, there may be one out there using somebody else's resource, but for the most part, I think they're all using ours. So I'll jump in and, and this is Brooke, um, say what I've been doing. I can't speak to Brooke at NMSU, but we've been using the um, HPC resource on campus in part because students have ready access to that. They have to just go through a little, uh, you know, sort of training session and, you know, take some quizzes and so forth. And that seems to be um, not a very big hurdle. I've had a number of students, well, all the students in this course and, um, take it as well as other students that I've worked with in various other capacities through research and other courses. And no one's ever complained that that was a significant hurdle to them, um, even if they had no former background in HPC or, or you know, computing really. Um, 
The HPC staff has also been really helpful. You know, they set up a whole different partition for, you know, the um, submitting jobs for the course, and that um, that's been handy and and helpful. So the resource here has been plenty for what we've needed. But again, we're not also. It's also true that we're not using the resources very heavily for this particular course. Christina, Tim, would you like to weigh in on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so this goes back in history. So when I was at uh, UCSD, that was basically about the time the TerraGrid was uh, finishing up. So TerraGrid, is one of the National Science Foundation projects, which has had several follow-ons since then. And so there were resources at UCSD that were used and resources you know, outside of UCSD. Um, when I went to Mines, we had our on-campus resources. I was at uh, Hello State for a while, and that was a combination of the resources through RMAC, and uh, they also had their on on-site prey, which was sort of coming to the end at that point. And at NREL, it's primarily on-site resources, although we do have access and some users that are working on some of the other DOE machines. And again, uh, like I said, I, uh, I have promoted the idea that you can build your own small cluster. And if anybody's interested on how that, how that all works, including installing the necessary software. Um, most of that I have scripted and if you want to talk about it, I'd be more than willing to talk with anybody that wants to reach out to me. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. So I think that that question was specifically about, you know, using national resources with allocations. Um, so in our case, our local system, as I mentioned, is allocation free. So anybody on campus can use it, including for classes. Um, I did talk with the, the instructor of this particular course about the goal, like the goals he was trying to accomplish. And if he, had, again, if he had really been set on like, you know, we want to do, I don't know, um, something on Amazon or on Google Compute, then we would have tried to connect him with our campus contacts who work with those groups and could have gotten something like an education allocation set up for them. Um, but there were, I think for his purposes, it was okay to just use our local resources. That's on that note. Go for it. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to share my perspective on that. So, you know, our decision here at the Air Force Academy was uh, we get our cadets, um, you know, counts on the DOD supercomputing resources. Um, and that was a conscious decision because we want them to actually learn how to use the environment that they'll be expected to use later on in life. Um, and, I, and I think what you'll find, you know, everyone here has different answers on how they're approaching this. Um, and that's fine. You know, I think it comes back to, you know, what are the educational goals, right? For us, um, it was more specific of, we want them to know how to use this system because we know that they will be using it later. You know, if your goals are more general in terms of, you know, HPC, generally speaking, or, you know, we don't know what they're going to do next, right? Because you don't know where they're going to you know, graduate and go off to, um, then you see a, a variety of answers there, right? So um, in, that, in that regard, though, too, for us, you know, we create accounts for all of our, our students. They're good for a year, and we have a, an educational allocation that they can leverage. That way, they're not managing, um, you know, individual allocations. But then for our research projects, you know, we have to plan ahead. Uh, so when they go on to 472, you know, the, the, what, it, what, you know, they'll, they'll, will, will transition their accounts to, to the different projects. Um, so there is definitely some, some forward thinking and planning that we have to do because it is not trivial for us to get, uh, you know, 130 cadets every year um, set up on the HPC if, if we haven't done the, the forward planning and the groundwork there. So everybody sort of touched on this, Christina specifically, um, but a lot of these courses are taking place on campus HPCs. However, there is also a national network of HPCs and um, a, there's also a distributed computing cluster that everyone has access to. 
Um, some of right, some of the schools will have allocations and you'll need to renew. Um, sometimes you don't have allocations you need to renew. Sometimes you don't have allocations and you don't need to renew. Right, it just sort of depends on the location. However, um, the national resources do require allocations that renew every year, but you can also generally request a classroom allocation. And so if you already are utilizing that resource for research, the classroom activities will not detract from the allocation and the time on the machines that you have through your research allocation. So if anybody's interested in any of that, um, I think a lot of the panelists here are either uh, campus champions and can give you um, information on how to access those national resources. Okay, can I follow up just a little bit on the, the cloud resources? Please. Um, so we've had a lot of uh, faculty, you know, reach out to us and, and are interested in the students are coming to them and saying, I want to learn cloud. And the university and a lot of universities have been trying to get uh, cloud resources available for the courses. I'm, I, I will just state for my, my personal opinion there is that uh, we still have a long way to go there because of the way the charging is. Um, the safety net to make sure that the students don't leave something running. Uh, you get alerts, but sometimes those alerts are a little late. Uh, so I generally give the advice that there's nothing wrong with providing information about cloud resources and wanting to incorporate it, but I also feel that I, the students need to be educated that, you know, that on-prem HPC is very similar to a cloud resource. If your educational goal is learning how to fire something up in the cloud um, and set up a database and, and do things like that, the Mays Business School does a lot of that because that's what their goal is, um, then that's fine. But a, a lot of people are just, it's the buzzword. I, the student thinks they need to learn cloud. And I think some education needs to be um, emphasized on why do you want to learn the cloud? And then they find out they actually don't want to learn the cloud. <laughs> So one of Rebecca's questions, Kristen, did you want to say something? I want to answer Daniel's question at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. I'm I'm back a few questions. <laughs> so one of the questions was, do you offer individual trainings for courses that are using your systems? And I think every both the faculty side and the support side can answer that. So Lisa, you talked about the YouTube videos. Would you like to expand on that? Because I'm feeling really bad for not offering that for our faculty. So I, I would actually like to start with answering that question. Um, so I, we've been heavily involved in the transition from HP to Access uh, since we do have HPC systems that are incorporated uh, into the national level. Um, and I, as far as incorporating um, the community colleges and the minority serving institutions, uh, we are on the road to uh, supporting that, um, both with an on-prem HPC system and uh, providing support with access. Uh, but the, currently the overhead for getting the accounts and getting everybody set up to be able to log in through access, uh, I feel only is is um, worth it for courses that heavily incorporate HPC into their course material. So if they're using it all semester, um, then I, fe I feel that that is definitely uh, worth the, if you wanna use a national resource and you don't have the on-prem available. Um, and it also gives them exposure to those resources that they can use later on because they are substantial, those resources. Um, 
the other one that we have uh, is that uh, we're trying to set up uh, and we, we just got some funding for it to get an HPC system uh, for the smaller schools. Um, and we've been working very hard. I don't know if you saw my slides, but there was a little icon for something called BRICS and that's for community colleges. Uh, so we've, we've had our focus there and it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge, but with the portal, if we can get past the authentication and getting accounts set up, um, yes, there's value in that and we're working in that direction. Christina, do you wanna follow up on that? So I wanted to answer, so the original question was individual trainings. And then oh well, yeah, we're we're crossing streams now. Yeah. We'll, so we'll I'll, I'll just, I'll just answer that one. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure, Rebecca. I'll I'll say what I think you were asking, <laughs> then you can clarify. Um, individual trainings for courses for us, it's not like the course uses us without our involvement. It's always a partnership, and so in that partnership we negotiate. Usually we go to the course and give a presentation but we're not doing anything. We're not creating homework assignments. We're not creating um, even specific examples necessarily. We're giving kind of our like canned, like here's our resources and here's how you get started with maybe a few tweaks. Um, and that's the extent that we participate in the course. And then it's inspected the instructor kind of partners with us. So um, it's not the situation where we would like offer training and then the course is kind of using us independently. Understood for for us we will actually go to the class and like depending on what the motivation is from the professor we will will edit our slides to fit their needs, so if they yeah. need to use a GPU if they need to use a specific right. software we will do that. Okay. So I was just curious yeah. if anyone else does something similar. Yeah, so I, I would say we do a little bit of customization, but we sort of we probably draw the line at creating like worked examples like sample code, but we are presentation materials we would adjust. I don't know if Tim or Chris have anything to add. Yeah, here. so uh, we do everything from one-on-one -on -one consultations to uh, workshops, um, and it's pretty much using a lot of the same materials. And as I said, you know, a lot of exam. We actually do a lot of examples. Um, we have uh, some um, Jupyter notebooks that actually. Uh, run through a lot of codes. Uh, this wasn't done by Beam, but there was a, another Tim at NREL that actually put together a Jupyter notebook for a command line interface, and that was really good. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's the full spectrum, one-on-one -on -one to uh, recorded classes. We don't currently do YouTube, but you know that has been discussed. And again, what I just said is applicable to both at NREL and all the uh, universities at which I worked. So I guess yeah, I should go academy, back to my answer. I was, um, was going to say the academy, I, our, my experience is much more focused because we, right, we provide a few classes in the discipline. Uh, but what we've learned is, you know, for undergraduate students at least, um, we, we provide very detailed tutorials on how to do every step of the process. Um, if you actually go back the first time we, we offered the CFD class, um, I, you know, I, this was before my time, but you know, the story goes, you know, we, uh, we just assumed that the cadets knew you know, what to do. We said, okay, you know, open, up, uh, you know, open up Putty and log in, you'll see the Linux terminal and start, you know, here's the commands. You know, and they said, what's a Linux terminal, right? What's, a, what's Putty, like, what is this? So you know, we provide very detailed instructions, but um, you know, I think that's it's kind of like the level we're working with them at, right? We're we're the subject matter experts working on a very specific application with them. You know, obviously, um, I, I would expect you know the HPCRC, for example, that provides the computing resources. You know, they don't provide that level of detail. Um, and as we work with other departments, you know, we work with them. Uh, but then, you know, us faculty in the department, you know, we develop we develop that higher level of of uh, you know, granularity. So. You know, I think it's, it is important to have those resources for those who need them, but, um, you know, different organizations, I think, can provide different level of help, um, you know, as appropriate. Thank you all. 
We've got a question from Daniel Howard. Many of the presentations focused on institutions with HPCs on site. Do these institutions partner with neighboring community colleges or minority serving institutions to offer these resources to other places without HPC resources? If not, does anyone here engage with other places with minimal HPC access to connect them to national HPC resource networks like Access, formerly known as Exceed? Yeah, so I'll I'll chime in now. Um, so I'm at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and we've definitely supported. We are currently supporting a course through like UW Extension, and are are definitely available to other um, universities in the system, um, the University of Wisconsin system. Um, I also have an OSG consortium Open Science pull hat that I wear sometimes, and I we've supported um, people getting trainings at different at different places. Um, that's a little more of a fuzzy line because we're primarily research funded. So purely educational um, endeavors. I would have to talk to my management, <laughs> but um, if people want to do trainings or courses that are around research, like developing research skills and research problems, um, then that's definitely something that we are kind of available to support. And as a as a national resource can support any um, US-based institution. I'm going to hop in on that one as well. So being located in the state of New Mexico, um, we have a lot of distributed universities, a lot of minorities serving institutions, um, and a lot of Native American institutions, right, tribal colleges. And we specifically have a partition on our resource that is there for classroom activities for anybody around the state. Um, through those partnerships and through some of the other both in-state and regional networks that we're a part of, um, we have several institutions with faculty members or grant writers that we're helping to assist with getting MRI grants written or other, right, um, the CC Star hardware when those are out to help those institutions get those resources on their local campuses as well. But like I said, I know several of the people here are also adept at being able to support anybody, whether they're from their institution or other institutions on getting access to national resources. Again, both the distributed computing, the OSG that Christina was talking about, or the national HPC um, access slash exceeds. So I don't have a lot to say about this because all access for uh, NREL's machines, there is access to universities, uh, but you have to have some Department of Energy project that you're working on. Uh, mines, when I was there as the director, uh, mines did not uh, have any accounts for uh, people outside of the university with the exception, they actually had a few NREL accounts for a short while. So not a much not much to say about that. Um, so one of the questions that I had for the panelists was how important and by being the support, this is also a question, right? But how important is the support from the HPC administrators or the HPC support team in the success? Right, the successful use of the HPC for these courses that you provide, like that you um, work with, support using your system. I'd say it's it's critical. Uh, without their support, you can't get anything done. Um, you know, as a faculty member, I know how to use these systems and I know how to set things up. But when you're dealing with 130 cadets, you've got to get all their accounts set up and. I forgot who, who it was that mentioned it before, but they're really good at finding all the really weird ways to break everything that you never even thought of. Um, you know, we, we would not be able to do this without the support of the High Performance Community Research Center here at the, at the Air Force Academy. So I'll second that. This is Brooke. Um, yeah, and, and mainly it's the administrative end of this, um, getting the account set up, getting 
you know, making sure the partitions are there and all of that stuff is, is really important. Um, I found that I've had to provide the support in the, in the classroom itself in terms of teaching the people what they need to know, but that seems pretty reasonable, but definitely there has to be a teamwork there. And I found the NMSU group to be quite helpful in that regard. I mean, I am support staff, <laughs> so I think we're crucial. No, um, I think the most important thing, I think Chris mentioned, honestly, account creation is one of those things that like you don't think about until you have to think about it. And then you're like, oh, this is painful. Um, and um, and that's a that's a computing center problem. Um, you know, I think we've had faculty that can be pretty self-sufficient. We just need to coordinate with them with things like account creation. Um, but another place where it's really important to stay connected to staff is like we once like upgraded a service like two days before an assignment was due and then that was not great so like um just making sure because we aren't providing like 24 7 365 guaranteed service like making sure we're in conversation like if things are going wrong um and having that relationship <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm also support and I think I'm pretty important. So I'll, I'll no, actually, uh, I'm myself and and other people in the group are sort of the front line uh, support staff, and you know we we do have the interaction with um, the ops people, and hopefully. Uh, the users don't have to talk to the apps people. So I agree with absolutely everything that has been said. <laughs> uh, so the the um, coordination with the faculty is critical. Um, for exactly the reason we have maintenance scheduled. I want to make sure that it doesn't fall on a day that they're giving a live exam on the system, which happens. Um, so that coordination is very important. Uh, we've worked out a lot of those. And so we, we don't often have a huge issue with that anymore. But in the past, it was definitely an issue. Um, so account creation, yes, uh, that's where some of the YouTube videos come in. Um, those little five minute getting started videos because the faculty can just send them a link to a five minute YouTube video on how to apply for the account. And then we will often provide the faculty with, you know, these are the three critical probably that you want to give to your students to streamline that. I'm trying to get the faculty to inform us sometimes that they're using our resources for a class. That's been a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we'll get questions and that's when we find out that they're using our system. Uh, so we have a, a pool of undergraduate students for the most part that field tickets that come in because a lot of the tickets have the same theme. Um, and it's just that the student either has not looked at the instructions or um, is having trouble understanding the instructions. Uh, so the undergraduate students field those tickets uh, for our staff. And we also keep an eye on them when you know things aren't being done well. Um, and then that feedback helps us update our documentation and our videos. Uh, so, so that's how we've handled that. For the more complicated classes, sometimes we do have people that go give an introduction. Um, and if they're going to be used, heavily using our resources, uh, we, when, they, when they first start using our system, we try to coordinate um, and help the faculty member uh, really streamline what they're doing and then every year it gets better and then we stop having to support them. So that's how we've built uh, the base of courses that have been able to incorporate HPC in their, their classes. Do any of the attendees have any additional questions for our panelists? I'm gonna take the crickets to me now. I, I have a comment I, though. One of the it. things I forgot to mention in my um, presentation was the portal, again, has been huge, uh, especially 
with COVID. But one of the things I forgot to mention that I, I think a lot of people don't know about is the view only link. So if you're teaching somebody remotely um, and you're both logged into the portal on the system, uh, if you're teaching a, a whole class of people remotely and they're doing something wrong and they can't figure out what's wrong, uh, a, a lot of people will put them into a Zoom room or have them share their screen, but then they're sharing it with everybody. And if you go into a Zoom room, you can't see what's going on in the main session. Um, on the launch, there's a view only link that they can click and send to you, and you can see their desktop in another browser window. And you can see exactly what they're doing and you can instruct them. So this is what I've done. Um, I do a lot of other uh, like summer events for cyber training, and we have people from all over the country. Uh, and, and that's what I use to provide support when we have substantial hands-on sessions using the HPC. And it, it's like an unknown secret. So if you Google, you know, open on demand view only link, um, it's really highly useful. I have a question. Um, so in your experience, how, for like anyone, not just <laughs> for you, um, but how difficult of a time do students typically have learning how to use the ACE PC, especially if they haven't ever used it before? And then actually like applying that to their class and helping them go forward. This is a great question. <laughs> um, so this touches on something I was thinking about when I was preparing, which is that there's a difference between teaching people how to use an HPC system and like how to do science using an HPC system. And it's a little subtle, but like the, the class I talked about, it's a little bit of both. We're actually teaching them how to submit jobs and there's been prerequisite skills taught using the shell. Um, and they are doing science, but it's like both goals. Um, I think that's, I think it's hard. Like, I think it's, you can't just expect that it's like a one class thing and people like poof, know how to submit jobs and how to use a system. If you really wanna teach people how to, you, how to utilize that kind of system, it has to be one of your learning goals from the course and you have to spend some time on it. That's different from, we were approached by a faculty member who wants to, who's like teaching the intro Python course for like the atmospheric and oceanic sciences department. And she just wants a server where her students can like run some desk parallel tasks. And so that's a very different setup. We wanna make something as very easy. It's almost not HPC at all. And um, the goal is for them to learn how to use that particular tool and not how to submit jobs to our high performance cluster. <laughs> and so we're gonna to try to make, use like a Jupyter interface and make it very like cookie cutter so that students can just log on and use it. Very similar to what Lisa was describing. So. I think it depends a lot on your goals as an instructor. I actually want to comment on uh, that uh, doing science part. One of the things that I really try to emphasize when I'm showing people how to use an HPC platform is that that's a $20 million piece of research equipment. And you need to treat it as such. And by that, I mean, um, you know, Think about you know what's the science that you're trying to do, um, and more importantly, or probably most importantly, everything that you do needs to be recorded. Every run that you do on an HPC platform, think of it as an experiment. And you know if you're running a script, automatically in that script, save every save your environment, save a copy of the script, save the output and you know, date stamp it, time stamp it, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can go back and reproduce what you have done. You, know, it's, you have a recording of what you've done because you know, if, if you're gonna publish, well, you, know, you need that stuff. And this is just a good practice to get into uh, is you know, treat, that, treat those runs as a scientific experiment with all anything that you would have re recorded in a notebook, uh, you know, a paper notebook, in some way, shape, or form, uh, should be recorded from an HPC run. I wanted to. Um, I think it's 
good good discussion here. Um, good distinction about doing science with HPC versus you know learning how to use an HPC. Um, I kind of want to talk more about the the latter there. Uh, you know, in our experience, I'd say there's actually a fairly steep learning curve uh, to get students uh, these days up and running on an, on the HPC system. And uh, what we found is over time that that learning curve has actually gotten steeper. Um, and the reason is, you know, if, if you look at just the, the way that young people today interact with computers and the type of interfaces that they're familiar with, uh, it's a lot more different than what it used to be. You know, um, you know, I think some people on this chat are, are young enough to, to know, you know, I, I certainly am, you know, my first computer at home, you know, you, you, do it up, you boot it up into a command prompt. And if you wanted a, a graphical interface, you'd open up Windows from there, right? Um, you know, versus our students these days are used to, you know, the, the most powerful computer that most of them use on a daily basis is their, um, their iPad. And so what we found is, you know, there's, there's a, a really big learning curve in terms of not just the interface and, and teaching them how to, how to navigate using a, a command prompt, um, but also just thinking about, you know, how the files are organized on the computer, how, how to access them. Um, and what are they actually doing when they log into a remote terminal and use that to upload their files and then send commands to a cluster that's actually somewhere else physically removed from where they are. Um, what we found is all of those things are, are lessons that we've had to incorporate into our curriculum to help them really understand not just how to set up jobs and run, but to actually understand what they're doing when they're interacting with the HPC systems. Um, and so that's been our experience at least, um, you know, that we've had to add more content in that regard so even though our end goal is we want them to be able to run CFD simulations, um, what we found is you know we need to teach them a little bit of computer engineering um, for them to understand what they're actually doing, and uh, that's been a challenge. Now that being said, though, by the end of the semester, you know they're all up and running. They understand what they're doing, and, and like I said, we've had a, a real high you know uptake on people who take the the advanced CFD class afterwards. So I, I think we're successful in getting them to where we want them to be, but um, you definitely have to be aware of the challenges and have a, a strategy and approach to address those challenges. Brooke, would you like to weigh in on that? So I guess, I, yeah, I, I have some comments related to the, just the previous points from the point of view of a faculty member teaching biology as opposed to teaching computing. And what I find in my students often is that they're not at all expecting to do any, um, you know, the kind of quantitative analysis that we're talking about. And so it's a matter of keeping their interest in the biology and also exposing them to the power of, you know, quantitative thinking and computing tools. And so I feel like um, I'm in a position where I can't really develop the way I would like to and feel that they ultimately need the, um, the skills that have just been mentioned about how, you know, computing really works and what really goes on. Um, much as I'd like them to learn that, I think that detracts from what I'm able to accomplish in the classroom with regard to the subject matter. And it, it, it drives away biology students to some degree um, to incorporate too much of that. So that's one of the reasons I've been trying to make use of the um, you know, GUI through the web and get them exposed to it without trying to build them, build in too much of the technicality of how the computing systems really work. So I think there are there are different contexts in which we are carrying out education and that there's not always um, possible to, to really delve into what they ought to know about um, the computing resources. And I wish we had, frankly, um, more of that in our curriculum so that we could build um, on a stronger foundation. Yeah, on that note, I think that's a great comment. What I'd say is our experience has been what we have to do is first excite them about the engineering and the science and kind of show them how HPC unlocks uh, this power that they don't have if they don't have the, the access to the system. 
Um, and then the rest of that, that comes along the way, you know, now that they've decided, hey, I care about this and I want to do it, you know, then we can teach them more about, well, here's what you need to know to understand what you're really doing, because um, that way, you know, you become self-sufficient. And, you know, when you have problems along the way, you know, instead of frustration, you actually have the tools to, to understand what's happening. But I fully agree, you know, you can't just start and say, let's learn about computers, because, uh, you know, our students don't want to learn about computers, otherwise they'd be computer science majors. Hi, I'm Fuad Ahmad, a computer science a PhD student in NMSU. Sometimes I use a remote uh, server. Those are, I think those are in NMSU science hall building. I don't know actually where. Is this uh, controlled by HPC? Hello? Did we lose sorry, our what? moderator? Can you re-ask the question? <laughs> oh, sorry. I would say uh, uh, I'm a PhD student in computer science here. Uh, from, sometimes I uh, access server, remote access from the command prompt from my local computer, the server. Uh, those computers, the server computers are is in controlled by HPC or is there only from this uh, within the department? I think that's a question for your local IT. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, sorry. Um, Dr. Dugas just messaged me saying her system died. So she's kicked out of the Zoom. Um, but I do know that if you, the website that you registered for the Zoom on, um, that will lead you to the HPC support system that we have at New Mexico State. Um, so you can go to that website and you can um, look on there. That way, if you have uh, questions for HBC staff or you want to reach out to them and ask them for help, um, they can help you through there. Oh, okay, okay, that's good. But uh, is there any system I'm using right now here from the HBC system? But I, I don't know, but I'm using that, something like this. Any software I'm using or any computer resource? Or, um, I think we don't have enough information to answer that question is the problem. Yeah, it sounds like you have specific questions about the server you're using at your institution. Oh, I'm sorry, if uh, anything I'm using right now for uh, lab access or whatever, sometimes I log in with my ID and I see all of, uh, those things are uh, there. From any computer I log in, I get, I get those things. So I, I think these are, uh, I'm accessing some server. Yeah, so if you're logging in remotely, you're logging into a server somewhere. And depending where you got the name of that server, that's the people that can tell you about like what it actually is and what its features are and how it works. And oh, then, none of us are at New Mexico State, so we can't help you. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Then, then these are, I think, these are from the department. <laughs> this yeah. Is from yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so it is 1130 right now. If there are no other questions, I do think um, we can wrap up. I don't think Dr. Dugas will be joining us back again. Um, but I do want to say thank you to everyone, all of our panelists for coming to present today. Um, thank you for offering this information. We will be sending out an email to everyone with I think all of you did say that it was okay to send out your emails if you guys have any questions. Um, that you want to ask specifically, we will be including their emails in that so you guys can reach out to them. Um, but aside from that, thank you guys for coming today. Um, and we will maybe see you guys next week. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Happy thank computing. You.